What I thought I could do um, in this uh, coming hour, first of all, I don't want to speak for an hour. I actually want to, uh, to um, you know, finish it with enough time for questions. Um, but what I thought I could do is give a bit of an overview of some of the financing flows around clean energy. There's all sorts of stuff going on. It's a very, very difficult sector to read. There's multiple technologies, there's multiple countries, there's multiple uh, policy mechanisms, and there's multiple... Um, points of view, multiple people who are broadcasting and trying to uh, sway the debate one way or another. And so our approach has always been start with the data, actually gather the data. And just by way of background, when I started the company, that was the first thing we did was build data sets of deals. Where's the money coming from? Where's the money going to? Uh, and so on. And now we've got a group of 35 people in South Africa who do nothing but enter that sort of information into data sets. Uh, the team overall is about 180 people. And so we've got to the point now where you know, the numbers you'll see, that you should have some degree of confidence that they represent, uh, at least in the trend and the direction, uh, where the world is going. And we're working with, the world, Bank, uh, with the, um, the world Economic Forum, with the UN, with the Pew. There's a big report that's just come out today, actually. Uh, that tends, and, and all these reports tend to use our figures because we're the only people um, stupid enough to have put the effort into this. So we'll talk about some of those um, investment flows and then I'll talk about some of the drivers, why they're moving in the directions that they're moving. Um, and that's much more subjective, there's a little bit of storytelling involved um, and no doubt some of you will look at it and say, I don't think that's what's going on at all and then things will get interesting uh, l later on in the session. So this is the overall, overall picture of investment in clean energy. So by means of definition, clean energy, we mean renewables, we mean energy efficiency, uh, what we call energy smart technology, so energy efficiency, power storage, uh, the smart grid, and also in these figures is carbon capture and storage, although in fact there's very little real investment in that as yet. We don't include nuclear, not because we're against nuclear, I actually studied nuclear uh, when I was at Cambridge, um, so we're definitely not against nuclear, and we'll talk a little bit about what's going on in Japan uh, later. So this is clean energy investment, and um, back here is when I started New Energy Finance, uh, and then you saw this enormous surge, for which I take almost sole responsibility. Um, so by the time you get up here, you're talking about an increase of 5x over about uh, six years in investment volume. Very impressive run-up, and you can also see here the impact of the crisis. So it was, it was growing at uh, 50%, 35%, 20%, and then it went flat, and then it took off again. And that's why we'll look a little bit behind uh, why uh, that was happening. Um, just to put it in context, this figure here of 243 billion, it's around 20% of all investment in the energy space. So this is, as I say, renewable energy, smart grid, power storage, energy efficiency, to the extent that you can separate those as investments. If you compare it to all the other stuff, upstream oil and gas, refining, generating, grids, distribution uh, uh, of, of electricity and so on, then uh, figures vary, but you'll get to around uh, 1.2 trillion plus or minus a couple, uh, couple of hundred billion uh, who's counting. So around 20%. And so one of the things, as, as certainly when I started the company, but even now, um, we get marginalized. You'll get people who say, uh, you know, and even uh, editors of, of business, major business newspapers, still talking about alternative energy. Um, and, and, you know, that's sort of when you extract the power from the hamster on the hamster wheel. Or, um, and, 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 you know, really there isn't the understanding in the broader business community just how substantial the flows of money are. And of course, one of the reasons is because only 0.4% or whatever it is of the world's energy comes from solar, it's easy to think that that's also 0.4% of investment. It isn't. It just means that we've started very recently investing in solar. And so the numbers are actually already quite substantial. So a little bit of recent history. This would have been, it would have been much more fun to stand here in 2007. Uh, this is an index that we published called the NEX. And um, we indexed it back to 100 at the beginning of 2003, and it saw this enormous ramp up. 
Uh, I'm very proud uh, that at the time we were talking about irrational exuberance and how uh, at, at best we expected it to trade sideways and we were raising questions uh, because during this period that was when every fund manager was launching either a clean tech fund or a clean energy fund or a climate fund uh, and the money was flowing in um, and of course what happened next we were saying that no industry that we found that we looked at uh, ever had that sort of a ramp up um, without then undergoing a correction so a five-year growth 30 percent per year plus for a whole industry unheard of uh, without one of those so sadly you know I can take credit for the 5x growth in investment activity in the sector but only on condition that I also take credit um, for the uh, for the financial crash and the recession that followed um, so what we saw since then, and it did get, the sector got very badly hit by that crash because you know, it's, a, it's an energy sector and energy prices dropped and it's very capital hungry uh, and the debt markets froze up and it's got risk, policy risk, a bit of technology risk and everybody became risk averse. So it really got hammered very, very hard, particularly because it was uh, probably overvalued to start with. Since then, it's been trading around flat, I mean it recovered a little bit. Um, and in fact, what's interesting, if you compare it to the other major indices where they have recovered and come back, particularly since the beginning of 2009, this sector is still out of favor. So until really three weeks ago, four weeks ago, until the events of Japan, this sector had really traded completely flat um, since the beginning of 2010, in fact, back into 2009. Um, and, and I think that a lot of that is to do with sentiment around uh, a few things. That, I, that, that we can talk about, but around uh, the, the collapse of the international negotiations uh, and around uh, climate skepticism and a cold winter and those sorts of things. So in the wake of the uh, financial crisis, where it really hurts is the cost of debt. For those of you um, who are going to be you know, graduating from here and going off to illustrious careers in the city, these sorts of things will become um, sort of the, the, you know, the, the meat and drink to you. But what you've got here is the interest rate over time. And this is the interest rate for a typical wind farm. So this might be a 200 megawatt or 100 megawatt wind farm in Europe. How, and of course, the cost of debt is enormously important because you've got your, the, you provide the equity and your equity providers need lots of returns. Now they want to get 15%, 20% returns. The only way you can do that is by leveraging up, by having some cheap debt uh, in the project, uh, because the debt, as you can see, costs only five, six, seven percent. And this is really a sort of history here of the financial crisis, because you can see the central bank rates going up, 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 up. And this was as the central bank, they tried to rein in the, 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 the very, very cheap debt that was leading to this uh, asset bubble through 2006, 7, 8. This is the European Central Bank, so they did something really dumb. They raised the, the, the rates even when the crisis had already started. And then this is how they've tried to pump money back into the system after the crash, dropping the rates very, very rapidly and to unprecedented low levels. But the problem that you've got is the financial system is not responding by passing on that cheap debt to the wind farm. You can see here that the rates actually went up even after the central bank had dropped its rates and they started to heal and then you've got the second leg of the European crisis. This is, um, you know, so, so this is sort of Greece and Ireland here. Uh, this was the immediate, um, in fact this was Greece, this was really Ireland uh, and then worries about Spain, Italy and so on. And so you can see what's happening is that the premiums that the financial system is charging for risk and the big ones are uh, what's known as the term swap. So the, the financial markets can borrow money a very short term. So they take deposits from you very short term. You can ask for them back any time. But they lend to a wind farm for 12 years or 14 years. And they expect to be paid for that, for that, that risk that they're taking. Um, and, and that's called the term risk. And then the second one here is actually the project risk. Well, they've all decided that wind farms are risky. Uh, if you look at the, what they used to, they used to think they were this risky and now they've decided that they're this risky. Of course, wind has not become more risky, it's become less risky. It's just that bankers have become more risk averse. So this is the pro one of the problems in the aftermath of the credit crunch, that what you're seeing is that the rate of debt for a wind farm is still around 
You know, if you had this sort of spread, a much more normal spread on that base rate, it ought to be coming in at 3 or 4%, and we'd be building these things like crazy. And by the way, there'd be jobs, and there'd be uh, a return to growth, and so on. So it is actually, it's not just that this was the fault of the bankers, actually this is the fault of the bankers too. The other thing that's been going on, and it's actually been, as I say, um, creating a dampener for the industry is the negotiations. These are the global negotiations. It actually all started in Rio, 1992, Gro Hall and Brundtland saying that we've got to deal with these very substantial problems. Um, Rio then spawned um, a couple of nice junkets, first a couple in Europe and then over to Kyoto. It only actually took five years to negotiate the Kyoto Protocol, um, but what followed was more junkets followed by the great events in Copenhagen and Cancun and this year Durban and then we're going to go back to Rio, Rio plus 20. When I say we, I won't because I actually don't bother. And that's really, that's part of the, the backdrop to why the sector is out of favor because Copenhagen was built up to be you know, two weeks to save the world uh, and if you think about it, you know, it was never going to be two weeks to save the world. Um, that was absolutely clear. In fact, this is something that, that we were saying, we were publishing, and I was trying to persuade the UN not to position it as two weeks to save the world, but sadly they didn't listen, um, and Gordon Brown called it two. I think that was actually his word. So um, this backdrop is very unhelpful. This is part of the reason uh, why the sector remains uh, out of favor, at least in terms of valuations on the stock markets. Nevertheless, if we look into that investment flow, the investment is happening. We did see that 30% growth in investment. This is quarterly now, the same period, the same uh, overall investment figures, but quarterly. And you can see a few things here. You, you see a, you know, a peak, you see this tremendous ramp up, then you see the financial crisis, then it trades sideways, and then it starts to take off again. Um, and we have this, actually it's a record quarter, it's not just a record year, but it's a record quarter out here. Uh, part of the reason for the great growth is that this actually uh, this quarter, very bad quarters following the crash work their way out. So why are we seeing uh, investment volumes reasonably healthy despite these negatives, despite the fact that valuations are low, despite the fact that we've got, we don't have the global policy environment uh, that we could have hoped for, despite the fact that debt still costs too much. And here's one of the reasons, which is clean stimulus. So green energy stimulus, green stimulus, call it what you want. But this is clean energy only. So taking and setting aside um, water and railways and all the other things that you might call green and just looking at the same definitions as we used for the overall figures. So you can compare this to the 240 billion and you see that about 60 billion of that actually came from stimulus funding. So uh, there was, the, the crisis happened back here in 2008. Um, 2009, um, very little stimulus fund funding actually flowed, 20 billion, but then it really does start to kick in and you have 60 billion of stimulus money and that clearly helps. You know, if you've got uh, a sector that needs 200 or is absorbing 240 billion or 200 billion order of magnitude and then you have a problem but you come along with this sort of checkbook, that's quite helpful. But it's not the whole story um, because there's still all the other investment. If you, you know, if you read the press, then you would think that all of the investment in the sector, it's all public money, and you know, no, if, you're, if you're a tea party, and none of it should be happening. The fact is that about a quarter of it comes from these stimulus funds, and the rest, the bulk, the vast bulk, is actually private money, supported by various policy mechanisms, which we'll look at. But I want to look at some of the other drivers, other than just the public checkbook. Uh, why we've seen this record uh, quarter and quite a resilient uh, performance in terms of money flowing into the sector. And the main and most important reason is actually increasing cost competitiveness of these technologies. So this is, uh, we do a lot of work on this, this is levelized costs. Um, and um, for those who are in the, you know, in the energy business or in the energy future lab, I'm sure you do this, uh, you, 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 you're familiar with the words, the terms. This is the cost setting aside the costs, of any support from you know, public subsidies. This is just trying to establish a base cost of the technology. Um, to be completely fair, it's also ignoring a lot of systems costs. So it doesn't include the cost of any backup that you might need. It's just looking at 
if you build this stuff and you run it and somebody buys the energy, what would they have to pay in order to pay for all of your costs and to remunerate you for the use of your capital? And what you can see is down here, coal, and you've got the, the basic equipment. Then on, on top we've put here, you can see the carbon price, if you use a European carbon price uh, forecast, and natural gas. And then you go into geothermal, geothermal, binary, municipal, solid waste, landfill gas. And you get into wind, uh, biomass incineration, gasification, biomass digestion. And then you start getting more expensive, wind offshore, so that STEG is what we call solar thermal electricity generation, so uh, uh, some people call it solar concentrator, but it's, it's a thermal technology, um, parabolic trough, and then photovoltaics up here. And then it goes out towards marine. And obviously, as soon as you get into that zone, 50 to $100 per megawatt hour, you're actually, broadly speaking, competitive. And quite a few of these clean energy technologies now are in that zone. Now, this is before you take a tax break, before you apply a feed-in tariff, uh, before you have a green energy certificate or any of the above. And this is a very different picture than you'd have seen uh, even three years ago, certainly five years ago or seven years ago. That those, all of those upper ones, all of the clean energy ones, would have been much further to the right. This is solar photovoltaics, experience curve, plotted log log, and you can see here quite a nice straight line as solar drives down the experience curve. This is silicon, this one here is thin film, largely first solar. You can see 1976, um, and then 2003, and then what happens here is it goes off trend, and this is because of the Germans. Um, they over-subsidize it, starting in 2004, overwhelm the supply chain. You could say they, you know, the, 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 they lay claim to all of the silicon there is in the world, um, and therefore the prices go sideways, which in solar terms is equivalent to going up. But what's interesting is then the last couple of years, they come down very rapidly, a 50% drop since 2008 in solar costs. Um, and one of the things that will be interesting, our summit in a week's time in, in New York, we've got Bjorn Lomborg giving the keynote, and I've just seen what he's written for USA Today. He says solar is pointless because, or I'm paraphrasing, but he says it's 10 times more expensive than, than, than uh, fossil-fueled power. He's just wrong. Uh, so I've actually emailed him to say, if you say that in New York, you are going to be laughed at. Uh, and he hasn't answered my email yet. <laughs> That's going to continue out into the future. Actually, interestingly, if you look at the experience curve, it curves slightly, probably because there's balance of plant, which doesn't quite go down. So it's not quite learning at the same rate as the actual material science. But nevertheless, taking all that into account, we're looking at another halving of solar costs between 2010 and 2020. And that's really significant because solar right now is fully competitive with retail electricity prices in a number of places in the world. So one of the, when you look at that LCOE chart, it compares wholesale to wholesale. But you know, it, it, there's no reason why we should be using expensive photovoltaics and feeding it into the grid and then having grid losses and having it difficult to deal with because of intermittency and clouds passing and so on. Solar's fabulous to use on buildings to power your air conditioning or if you've got some local storage or to charge your electric vehicle. And at that point, it is already economically competitive with no support whatsoever in parts of the world. If you've got a sunny part of the world with either high daytime electricity prices or an unreliable grid or both, um, then you should be doing photovoltaics right here, right now. One of the things on LCOEs I just want to point out is that it's not just about capital cost, and it's not just about how much the sun shines. What's really important is, is also to lower your cost of capital. And so we're doing a lot of work. You'll see actually there's a report comes out with the World Economic Forum on Friday where we've looked at how do you drive down the cost of clean energy. Because again, a lot of people think, well, if you want to, if you want to jump the costs down that curve, get in the lab, go and do research in the lab. Actually, you need lab work, 
You need a supply chain and you need to push down the, the process engineering and, and, and build out uh, the scale of the industry. But you also need cheap finance. This is my argument, my, this is my, my um, rationale for uh, new Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Um, it can make a real difference. This is for solar, uh, the difference between project finance in Germany, you'll get a $10, you get a $10 impact, a $10 reduction in your levelized cost per megawatt hour versus US tax equity, which is on again, off again, depends on profits and so on, and therefore drives up your cost of capital. Equally, well, you've got, there's some other, there are lots of other variables we've looked at. The ability to leverage, the ability to get cheap equity, in other words, to sell them to the right people, uh, usually utilities, rather than have private equity companies own them and so on. But it's not just solar, this is wind. We publish a wind turbine price index. If you go out here, you'll see the price coming down, the experience curve, just like for solar, no difference whatsoever. Uh, but then again, in 2004, it turns around, it goes up, this time not just because of the Germans, also because of um, commodity prices. What you'll see is steel prices really have an impact on wind because of the towers, because of the, the sheer bulk of them, the amount of steel. And so if you actually adjust for steel prices, these things come down uh, in price. And what we're seeing is from the peak, it's already 20% down. In fact, I think it's, mo it's more than that. We're now down, um, back down to um, levels in euros for price per megawatt capacity, which we haven't seen since 2005. Um, if you also uh, calculate in that the turbines today are more efficient, that they'll extract more energy wind for wind than what we were building in 2005, and they're more reliable, then you can see how the levelized cost has come down uh, considerably. And this is, again, these are, what, these are areas where the general public, the general business public, has not kept up with reality. This is a perception. The perception is that wind is all about um, $120 per megawatt hour, 12 cents per kilowatt hour, um, and that coal is about 30. And you'll see this time and again in articles, and time and again you'll hear it from educated public, business people, even people in the energy industry. This is the reality. And I, it's a bit of a cheat here because you've got best new wind. Um, but a really good wind farm at scale in a good location feeding into a grid which can use all its output. That's very important because if the grid can't accept it, if it, it then you could end up with electricity prices going negative and all those sorts of things. You could end up, end up with the, uh, uh, the, the utility telling the wind farm to shut down. But assuming that the grid can absorb the power, that your users are there and that the grid is robust and it can take that power, then wind comes in at around $68 per megawatt hour. And new coal, new coal is not fully depreciated. This figure of three cents, fine. If you've got an old coal-fired power station that was built 40 years ago and you're no longer paying any interest, sure, it's cheap to use. But new coal has to pay, it has to cover its interest charges. And economically, it has to cover the cost of the capital that is, uh, that, 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 that is embodied in that plant. Um, new coal also has to meet stringent pollution uh, requirements, and that has costs. So what you've got is a, a difference between the perception of uncompetitive clean energy and the reality that those in the clean energy space know, uh, which is that this is actually very competitive. And this is before applying any incentives or subsidies. So that's one of the reasons why We've seen this good performance. We've seen that part of, partly it is um, the, the uh, stimulus funds. A lot of it is just to do with the economics. There's also some systemic changes. There's things happening at a scale and a pace which are, uh, which, which are getting towards some sorts of tipping points. Let me put it that way. So here you've got fossil fuel capacity investment here, and this is clean energy. And I alluded to this at the beginning of my remarks that what you see is that inv total investment in generating capacity in clean energy is now approaching parity with fossil. And it's clear that it'll only be a number of years uh, before it, it pushes through um, that barrier. Other systemic changes that we're seeing, we've got the launch of electric vehicles. The economics of electric vehicles are dramatically different now than where they were five, ten years ago for all sorts of reasons. Battery costs are still a problem, yes, but a lot of the 
the electronics, the electrical engineering behind them is substantially different and cheaper now than it was back then. So we're seeing major product launches. The, clearly, um, you know, it's great to see the Tesla, but not many of us are going to drive one. But you know, the, the Nissan Leaf uh, and the GM Volt, these are really significant product launches. These embody billions of dollars of research, uh, marketing spend, and so on. And if you calculate the cost to drive one of those cars, setting aside any incentive programs, the cost per mile, the cost per kilometer of driving those cars, they are competitive now. And so, given all of the other externalities, this is a system change that we are going to see on our streets. Other things going on, smart grid, these are smart grid projects around the world. Uh, I think our database includes something like 360 smart grid pilots and projects. Um, it, it is an area of dynamism everywhere from the US, uh, out in Japan, China. There's almost no country that is not in some way pushing towards uh, investing its um, grid and its energy distribution system with intelligence. Either focusing on the grid, if you're India you want to reduce losses, um, if you're California you want to make sure that you can continue, you don't have to build any more power stations so you're focusing much more on energy efficiency. But this is a systemic change that's also occurring. And you can see it in um, the market cap of companies. So this is, um, if you remember at the beginning I showed the NEX index, quoted index of, energy of clean energy companies, um, the one that crashed. Uh, this is the market cap. So this is the, these are the constituents. You can see here wind, solar, hydro, geothermal, bioenergy. And then down here, power storage, efficiency, and energy conversion, which broadly means um, fuel cells. And what you can see is that by 2011, around 45% of the valuation, in fact that red box in the wrong place, you should include power storage, should be up there. Around 45% of the market value of clean energy stocks is nothing to do with the generating side of the equation that we looked at earlier. It's actually to do with how do you store it, how do you move it around, how do you measure it, how do you secure it from uh, attack by hackers and all of those things. So we're seeing those, we're seeing the nature of what clean energy is changing during this period. One of the other drivers, and I think I, I, think I put it in the, in the box as a driver, because it is, actually, um, it is actually forcing behaviors to accelerate, is that there is a clean energy race going on. What you've got here, this is Europe, Middle East, Africa. These are the Americas. This is uh, Asia, Oceania. And you can see that if you go back to, I think the scale's fallen off here, but this will be 2000 and, uh, I'm going to say 10, 9, 8, 7, 2007 you'll see 60 billion of investment in Europe, Middle East, Africa, growing to 94 billion, but quite far ahead of either the Americas or Asia. If you go back further, by the way, you'll find that this is pretty much a European game. So you go back to 2000, and clean energy means wind in Germany and Denmark. If you go back to 1990, I think, or even before, then it means wind in the US, but, uh, but that's, a, that, that's, a, uh, that's even further back in history. But what you can see here is that this enormous increase in activity in Asia, which has left it just behind uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And in fact, for most of last year, I was confidently predicting that Asia, having overtaken the US back in 2009, you see there, 50 billion, and here's 60 billion odd, um, so having overtaken the US in 2009, I was saying, and 2010 is the year when Asia overtakes Europe. And everybody's, ooh and ah, whether they're in Asia, whether they're in Europe. Actually, it didn't happen, and the reason is because of an extraordinary surge in small solar rooftop systems in Germany. Around 8 gigawatts of solar systems in Germany. Put it in perspective, they only have 80 gigawatts of demand uh, peak during the summer. So another few years uh, of that, and it's unclear what they will do uh, with the power. Uh, but that's what you're seeing up there is this enormous surge uh, because you've also seen, uh, it, it's bigger than it looks because what you've seen is also Spain almost entirely drop out and so on. So on a quarterly basis, this is the same thing but looking at the US, you can see um, investment quarter by quarter it grows. This is the period when you know, Leonardo DiCaprio is out there and there's the inconvenient truth and so on. Then you get the financial crisis 
The US financial markets are very quick to respond to a crisis. You can see an absolute drop off and then it comes back in. It takes a while for those American Reconstruction Reinvestment Act funds to start flowing, but there they are and you see the thing starts to turn upwards. This is Europe. Crisis? What crisis? The European Investment Bank actually stepped in very well, did, did the sector a great favor by making funds available in that period, uh, whenever it was, to that beginning at uh, Q3, Q4, 2008, Q1, 2009. And so you don't see that very rapid, dramatic drop that we saw in America. But equally, it's still trending downwards, not upwards. And that's because of the problems in Ireland and in Greece and so on, and Spain. This is Spain. Um, this here is the, uh, the IPO of Iberdrola Renovables. They're actually, I think Iberdrola has offered to take it back private at about half of that price. Um, I have to work, I don't think that that's a transaction that would show up here. Um, but um, what you can see is there was this enormous boom in 2008 of solar in Spain. They took the tariffs which were being paid in Germany and said, well, we want some of that activity. We clearly need to pay the same. What they didn't realize is solar produces about 30% more output in Spain than in Germany. And so, of course, all the developers said, whoopee, free money. Um, and then they've actually rescinded, not, you know, it's not just that they've stopped doing that. They've actually retrospectively said, ah, although we said those rates were very high, you're only going to get them for a certain number of hours per year. So they're actually changing the rules retrospectively on investors. And that's a really, really dumb thing to do because investor, that's probably the one thing investors hate more than anything is a retrospective rule change. So how they're going to finance what they want to do in the future is, is, is anybody's guess. But this is China. And you can see here, around 2005, you get the first Chinese renewable energy laws. Uh, then you get industrial policy. You get um, encouraging... Uh, overseas companies to bring technology in by using things like local content rules. Um, then you get uh, uh, tariffs on uh, overseas imports, so that if you do want to do these projects in China, you actually have to buy Chinese. And then you get wadgers of very cheap capital. And when I say wadgers, I mean, that's a, that's a technical term for, like, really, really, really lots of money. Um, China Development Bank in the last half of 2010, made about 30, I think it's 36 billion dollars available to Chinese manufacturers. And we're talking about solar and wind manufacturers who had no chance of using that money to invest in their own manufacturing capacity. So the only possible use for much of it is essentially as vendor finance. So that those Chinese companies can go to Brazil and say, well, if you want to build a wind farm, not only can we bring you the technology, but we can also help you to fund it. And the, and the interest rates that they can offer can't be met uh, by Western providers of technology or capital. So they are very much pouring the, the cheap money onto the flames that they lit back during this period here. And there you see it in terms of asset finance. Uh, they are also investing a lot in Chinese uh, uh, projects themselves, these wind mega bases in Mongolia, they're talking about 10 gigawatt type projects, we're still sort of, we still think a gigawatt is big. Um, and then here you've got the US in second place, Brazil, Germany, Italy, Spain, uh, and so on, United Kingdom down here. Actually in 2009, the United Kingdom was in third place because we funded some of the offshore wind projects in 2009 and then sort of shot up the leaderboard, but we didn't stay there for very long. What that means in terms of manufacturers, um, here you've got top 10 global wind and solar manufacturers. If you go back um, 10 years, none of these companies would have been Chinese. Um, now you're talking about Insolar, SunTech, JA Solar, Trina, Yingli. Interestingly, first solar at this point, according to these figures, or our, our figures for, um, at the top, but I can tell you, I, I think these were produced actually before, they were just part way, or halfway through 2010, in fact, I don't think First Solar was in, to in first place. I think SunTech uh, is in first place. In wind, Sinovel, Goldwing, Dongfang, even three years ago, this would have been an extraordinary picture. If we would have said three years ago that three Chinese companies are in the top ten for wind manufacturing, you'd have got raised eyebrows uh, and you'd have got sat down for a cup of tea. Um, but this is the true situation now, extraordinary acceleration.
And by the way, just to put it, to put it in perspective, you know, Sharp used to be the world leader for solar photovoltaics. And you think, well, how did they, how did they lose leadership? How does one do that, to be in such a promising sector as world leader, and then suddenly wake up three, four years later, and you're only in sixth place? Um, is it because they just didn't invest? The answer is no. What they actually did is they grew their output by something like 40-50% per year. But these other companies grew by thousands of percent per year. And that's what's going on in, no, in, in terms of this uh, international rivalry. Let's see if this works. Kieran, where's Kieran? There we go. If this doesn't work, it's Kieran's fault. Let's have a look at how this works. This is a lovely chart, um, because what you've got up here is Asia and Oceania. Uh, here you've got the Americas, and here you've got uh, the Middle East and Africa. And this is a sort of, it's a nice way of plotting this, because you, you can see this tripolar race playing out. Here we've got solar manufacturing, uh, and this is 2006. So we can now run the clock, 2007, 8, 9, 10. So as it moves upwards, you can see that industry physically moving its center of mass towards Asia. So this one is wind, wind generating capacity. I said that a few years ago, if you go back to, 2000, uh, to the year 2000, the clean energy industry was European wind, Germany, Spain, uh, and Denmark. Just run the clock. It flirts with Americas, and then essentially turns tail and heads towards Asia. This is initial public offerings, IPOs. So this is where the money starts to follow. Forget Europe, go to Asia. And this is venture capital and private equity. Now this is really interesting, okay? Because what's happening is that America is following a different strategy. I don't think America necessarily knows in the sense that it's, a, it's not a coherent, although actually if you talk to, um, if you talk to Chu, to, the, uh, to, to Dr. Chu, the uh, energy secretary, I think he probably would describe it as a strategy. America is taking a technology-based strategy. Um, so if you can characterize those three regions, what you've got is America, it's not just venture capital and private equity, which has just done so much better and at such bigger scale in the US, but also a much greater proportion of the Reconstruction and Reinvestment Act monies uh, is invested in technology, it's in research, or it's in monies to help new projects, the, 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 the so-called valley of death, the first new project using any technology, um, is supported with a loan guarantee in the US, nowhere else in the world. Um, the national lab system, the American university system, the fact that American corporations spend more on R&D. This is the Lockheeds and the Boeings and the GEs spend more on R&D. So that's America's strategy, where China's strategy is, yeah, lots of domestic demand, lots of cheap finance, vendor finance, and domination of essentially the current generation of technology crystalline silicon, and wind turbines, which are nearly as good, but not quite as good as the Europeans. The European, uh, European strategy is actually to generate demand, feed-in tariffs. Just throw money at it, and something good will happen. And of course, the big risk for Europe is that you get squeezed between these two. American technology licensed to Asian manufacturing to feed demand created in Europe whose benefits uh, don't reside in Europe. It's a very risky picture for Europe. So the final driver set that I'll talk about is to come back to some of the things that are going on, not in clean energy, but around clean energy. Beginning of last year, April last year, um, it's, all, it's so easy to forget this now that we've got uh, you know, Fukushima and, uh, and, and the, the nuclear events in, in uh, Japan going on, but you know, this, this was a major, this was a, an event of a magnitude that changes the economics of the oil industry. At the very least, there will be a raft of new regulation. After the Piper Alpha disaster in the UK, there were over a hundred new pieces of regulation governing uh, the use of offshore drilling rigs. And it was things like making sure you had a register of who was on the rig and who wasn't and who had worked how many hours. All very ad hoc, 
until suddenly they found that this was a big problem when there was a disaster. Uh, and it costs money to do those sorts of things. So this will drive up the cost of deep offshore oil. And deep offshore oil, like the stuff coming out of the Gulf of Mexico, is the marginal barrel of oil in the current system. So this is very good news for Saudi Arabia. It's very good news for Canadian tar sands uh, producers. Um, it's very bad news for small deep water drillers who won't be able to meet these new regulations. Um, and, but it is meaningfully pushing up the cost of oil. And I thought, you know, for most of, most of last year, we thought that was sort of, you know, that was a big event that was going to have uh, profound uh, implications for energy economics. Um, this does too. This is, um, this is actually also proof of why it's extremely difficult to be an analyst and try and forecast anything. This is a vegetable seller in Tunisia who kicks off a series of events which I don't think anybody could have forecast. This wave, and it's going on, it's not finished, we don't know how that is going to play out, but it is already having profound uh, impacts on oil prices. And you could say, well, maybe those are temporary impacts. Probably what they look like is a period of very high oil prices. And then if this does lead to liberalization, then at some point it ought to translate into better economic performance, investment in technologies, and so on, and then ultimately lower oil prices. But the risks aren't going to go away. This is Saudi Arabia, 20% of the world's oil reserves, and a little geography lesson. That little thing there is the Straits of Hormuz. 17% of the world's oil flows through that little bit there. And what you've got, that's Iran on one side of it, and that's Bahrain on the other side of it, and that's Yemen not far away, and that's Saudi, and nobody knows what's going to happen there. And this is going to have, continue to have implications for energy economics that are going to push clean energy forwards. It is very, very hard to believe that the costs of this, that the risk of this, is properly priced into investors' calculations and policymakers' calculations. And then you've got uh, Fukushima uh, as still unfolding. It's still unclear where it goes. It looks like there's been some sort of partial meltdown, but nobody really knows exactly why we're finding what we are finding uh, in the water uh, and in, in the environment around that plant. So it's not over yet, but it does look like it will be brought under control. It's actually a, an enormous testament to these uh, engineers that they've managed to do what they've, what, what they've done. This will cause a wholesale recalculation of energy futures. Um, this is a lot of work for energy modelers. Um, interestingly, if you go back to the safety of nuclear, um, you shouldn't actually have to recalculate anything. You should just, it's pretty clear that the, the nuclear renaissance is the direction to go. This is um, a lovely graphic. I sort of slightly nicked it from somebody else. I can't remember who, but this is the, the number of deaths per terawatt hour from coal in China, from oil globally, US coal, which is about the same as bioenergy. And this is nuclear if you believe the worst case of the Greenpeace um, uh, estimates of, which are actually, I mean, there's some sort of pseudo peer reviewed figures of nearly a million people around the world dying as a result of Chernobyl. And if you believe those, that's nuclear. And if you don't believe those, but you believe the UN and, uh, and the, the figures that are more robustly peer reviewed, then you come to this figure for nuclear. Interestingly, that's gas. You just type, into, you type gas explosion into Google. Hydro. Almost all of hydro is one accident in China. Solar and wind. And clearly, you, know, you would like that to be not there at all, to be just a, a vanishing dot. Uh, but it's a lot smaller than any of the alternatives, uh, other than nuclear. So where will we go with, this, uh, with what's going on? It's very early days to say. Um, I have a sort of simple, this is kind of like, uh, Michael's idiot guide to where you might want to uh, do and not do nuclear. I've got two dimensions here. This is earthquake risk, and this is governance risk. And the proxy I'm using for governance risk is, is it a democracy? <laughs> and what you see here is you've got China, lots of earthquakes, not democratic. Iran, slightly few earthquakes, but still quite a few, and not democratic at all. 
Uh, you've got the Europeans over here, uh, and Canada. I think Canada essentially is a European country. Um, and then you've got the USA and Japan, which is you know, a lot of earthquakes, clearly, uh, but actually has very good governance. And I, re I use this democracy uh, index because you know, if you're going to do nuclear, you need transparency. You want people to fess up when they make a mistake. You do not want people to hide what they've been up to. And that tends to, that tends to correlate with a free press and with good governance and democracy. What you've got up here, very interestingly, is a bunch of countries that we've already seen today. Saudi, Yemen, Tunisia, Syria, Libya. All these countries quite seriously want to build nuclear. That's what I think is the safe area. So where are we? I think that you know, there is a lot of confusion, multiple technologies, policies, countries, and so on. But fundamentally, this is a transformation of the world's energy system. I mean, this is why, maybe, I'm, maybe this is just a pitch for the Energy Futures Lab. This is the most dynamic major industry in the world, bar none. Social networking, pa. <laughs> it's going to cost trillions. It's, it's going to take decades, a great place to have a career. It's going to be policy driven, because this stuff isn't just going to happen by itself. Um, there are just too many. Uh, boundary conditions, too many stakeholders, and the economics is too complicated. It's going to require incentives and disincentives. The money involved is too much for it simply to be something that the governments can pay for. It's going to require the capital markets and what they call public-private partnerships. When I work out what those are, I'll tell you. <laughs> but here, it will be risky to bet against. Too often, over the past five, six, seven years, I've heard people say, well, you know, we don't invest in clean energy. We prefer oil and gas, or the car industry, or the retail industry, or the tourism industry, or the airline industry, or whatever, because we just understand it, it's, low, it's less risk than this clean energy stuff. I think that those investors and those policymakers are making a profound mistake if they think that those things are more risky than clean energy. So, uh, I've run over a little bit from what I wanted to do, but uh, we've got time for a few questions. <laughs>